Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Dear friends, dear colleagues, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Javier Cortez. I am leading the breast cancer program at International Breast Cancer Center in Madrid and Barcelona. Welcome you all to this program titled The Changing Landscape for HER2 Positive Advanced or Metastatic Breast Cancer Clinical Experience with Novel Anti HER2 Directed Therapies. It is absolutely my terrific pleasure to be joined today by a great friend, a great colleague, and someone that I, 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 I like so much, Sanu Modi. <laughs> She's a terrific medical oncologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, in the US. Sanu, very, very welcome. Okay, thank you, Javier. You know, it's my pleasure to be here and to be here with you especially. <laughs> thank you, my friend. And why are we here today? We all know that the landscape of uh, HER2 positive advanced breast cancer has dramatically changed over the last years. And maybe in these one to two to three years have changed a lot with great drugs, which uh, have been approved in some countries and hopefully will be approved in other countries very early on time. So today we will try to discuss together the use of HER2 directed uh, targeted therapies, including recent data that have been presented at our major conferences, such as ASCO, ESMO and San Antonio, and how these new agents are making the difference when we treat our patients. So, Sanu, let's start from the very beginning. So, from your perspective in the United States, which or what are the current guideline recommendations for the treatment of patients with HER2 positive advanced breast cancer? Yeah, I mean, so, so you know, we have a couple of different reference guidelines, but I think in general, when we talk about advanced stage HER2 positive breast cancer, you know, the preferred first line treatment has really been a combination of a taxane plus dual HER2 targeted therapy with trastuzumab plus pertuzumab. And, and you know, this is based on the, the exceptional data that we got from the Cleopatra trial, which was a first line study. And in that study, they specifically used docetaxel. Although at Memorial here, we did a follow up study um, using paclitaxel, weekly paclitaxel, and both. I think show very similar results. And the key is using this triplet therapy compared to the prior standard of care, we saw a tremendous survival advantage for, for the dual blockade. And so that's really become our preferred first line option for the vast majority of patients with advanced stage or two positive disease. So let me make a couple, couple of comments. I think that you published, uh, your team published the data of Paclitaxel. Right. And I think that a great majority of us, at least in Spain, are using that schema. We are using paclitaxel plus trastuzumab and plus pertuzumab as our standard of care. We do not use docetaxel in general. But let me go back to the clinic, okay? You know that more and more we are using uh, a pertuzumab in combination with trastuzumab in the early breast cancer setting as tn one for those patients who did not achieve a PCR. So do you think that in the you know, upcoming years, this is something that will impact in the way we treat our patients in the first line setting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we have taken all of our best drugs from the metastatic setting and have moved them now into the early stage space, obviously hoping to cure more patients so we don't have to treat them later on. But, but the reality is when we are already starting to see some examples of this where patients are uh, relapsing in spite of having pertuzumab and, and even TDM1 in the early stage. So, you know, there, there clearly is a need for 
follow-up therapies. I mean, drugs that are still active after our best and most potent HER2 targeted agents have failed. So for the time being, I mean, that space is, is a little bit, the, the, our treatment, I think our approach is a little bit guided by the duration, the disease-free interval, I guess, is what I would say. You know, how long has it been since they had pertuzumab? How long has it been since they had TDM1? And if there's been a reasonable gap, and we, we tend to use 12 months, you know, in, in our field in general, if there's been that kind of an interval between the, their dose in the adjuvant setting to the metastatic setting, we will often retreat with those drugs. So I would still offer THP, for example, to, to someone who had, you know, their adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy two years ago and then relapsed. Similarly with TDM1, if there is a long gap. Let me pick your brain up, Sanu. So, <laughs> so you know the data of Emilia, okay? Yeah. TDM1 in second line, or even those patients with very rapidly uh, progression, progression of the disease we use TD1 as the standard of care. Also in the Cleopatra, the, the disease free interval uh, was at least one year or more. In the Emilia, six months or less. So what about patients between six months to one year after trastuzumab or after trastuzumab and pertuzumab in the early breast cancer setting? Would you allow these patients to be retreated with pertuzumab or would you prefer to jump into TD1 directly? Yeah, I, I think if, if it's within six months, I would probably jump to a different drug. You know, I think that that tells you that they that there is something a little more aggressive uh, and potentially resistant uh, with that cancer. So with such a short interval, I would be looking at an alternate drug, a different drug. And more than 12, 12 months, I think that we would retreat the patient with the same schema. Yes. And between six and 12, I think that it depends patient by patient yes. what we do in the clinical practice. In that interim, the six to 12 range, it really becomes, I think, a judgment call. And, and you know, you, you want to try and choose something that you think is still going to work with the fewest side effects for that patient. And it may depend to some extent on the burden of disease that patient presents with. So then it, be, then it really becomes some judgment, I think. Um, we extrapolate as best as we can from the data. Okay, I think that Sanu, this is the, I think the majority of, of the countries or a, a significant number of countries, we are doing this first and second line in a very similar way. I think that we treat patients with pertuzumab based therapy in the first line setting, in general, mm -hmm. and TDM1, in the second line therapy. Right. But you are lucky, my friend, because you know <laughs> that in your country, in the US, the FDA approved other strategies right. uh, this last year. I think that you have the Ruxtecan, you have Enratinib, and you have a Tucatinib-based therapy approved to be used for your, for your patients. So can you just say something about these three different strategies very briefly because I would like afterwards to start discussing in, in more detail all these different approaches. Yeah, I mean, look, you're right. We're, you know, for a long time, we had a first line, second line, and then the third line was really wide open. Lots of choices. Most of them were not very active therapies. I mean, we had very modest expectations. <clears throat> and then this past year, almost within a span of six months, we saw the approval of three new targeted HER2 therapies. Um, two are both tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the tucatinib and neuratinib drugs, both pills. And then the third, of course, is a new HER2 antibody drug conjugate, trastuzumab directs to chem. So in a short period of time, we now suddenly have multiple great active options for our pre-treated patients. And, and it's now we're, we're uh, in a way struggling to figure out the optimal sequencing of these therapies to give patients the maximum benefits. Yeah, okay. So, unfortunately, uh, I only have had experience with trastuzumab deruxtecan or DS8201 in clinical studies at this time because the drug has not been yet approved in, in Europe. So, what I, can, what I can tell you is that in my experience, the, 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 the time to response is very, very short with this drug, and responses are absolutely terrific, are, are exceptional. So you are one of the key investigators with this drug. You have uh, published the New England Journal of Medicine with the phase two data, and you have also presented the updated data 
at San Antonio with the, with the uh, Trastos Madurukstik and the Destiny Breast Zero One study. So you uh, presented a terrific median progression free survival and also a very interesting median over a survival of yeah. about two years, more or less. So can you make some comments? How do you think it compares with other data we have in the clinic? I know that we should not do that, but yeah. at the end, you have this data and, and, and all of us compare. Can you make some comments about that? Yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, yeah, you know, we and myself personally have had a lot of experience with using TDXD. We did participate in the phase one, phase two, and, and now we are participating in phase three trials. And I think it's it goes without question that this is a really active and potent new therapy. Uh, you know, we've used antibody drug conjugates before, TDM1, of course, and, and it's a very, again, a really active, exceptional drug. This works, TDXD works even after TDM1 fails. Uh, so it tells you something already about how effective this therapy is. Um, and so, so, you know, we had presented the original data. It was last San Antonio meeting. And even back then, I thought the data was, was really remarkable. Um, for a group of patients that had had all the best HER2 targeted drugs and many, many lines of therapy to see the results that we did in terms of progression-free survival, overall response rate, I mean, it was spectacular. And this year now, with an additional nine months, even more follow-up, uh, the, the, the results are, are even more impressive, if that's possible. So what, you know, we saw an improvement in the PFS now to over 19 months. We saw the duration of response of almost 20, you know, 20 months. I mean, these are the kinds of numbers we see in studies in the first line setting, like Cleopatra. We don't expect to see this kind of activity in patients who are on their fifth or sixth line of therapy. So the data is still fantastic. Um, one of the new things that we presented this time was the median overall survival. Uh, status of the, of the patients in in the Destiny Breast One trial, last last uh, uh, last time we didn't have that number. This time we have a median, and the number I mean by in, in and of itself again in a pretreated group of patients, a 25 month uh, median overall survival is really impressive for this cohort of patients. I think some people have have uh, you know picked up on the fact that the median PFS was 19 months, the median OS was uh, you know 25 months. We would have expected a much bigger median overall survival, and I think that may still happen. The, this median survival data that we presented was very early, meaning the data is not mature. There are still a number, a very, very large number, actually, of patients that are still alive and still being followed on the study. They were censored at the time of this data cut, so we couldn't include their, their, them in, in, in the analysis. So I ask people to be patient, and I think with more time, we are going to see that even the median overall survival is going to improve substantially as we get more mature follow-up from this study. So, so really, these are unprecedented, I think, efficacy data. Um, without question, I think this is one of the most active drugs I've seen for HER2 positive. I can't, I can't agree more with you, Shanu. So I remember when you presented, uh, or Ian presented, and you, you published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the, the, the first data of the Destiny Breast 01 study. And we were absolutely, you know, surprised with the impressive medium progression of Fisubal at that time. But also we were listening to many of our colleagues talking about toxicity. And right. you reported, we reported a 2.2% uh, of patients who, who, who passed away because of the ILD, because of the pneumonitis like toxicity. Right. What surprised me more about the data you presented at San Antonio was not only the efficacy, but it was, but also the, the toxicity, because I would expect to have much more number of patients with important toxicity, but it was not true. I mean, I think that we have, of course, a little bit more numbers of, of, of adverse events, but it was quite, 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 quite lower, or quite low, as I would expect. Can you make a comment about why with nine months or, or, or a higher follow-up, we did not have an impressive increase in toxicity? Yeah, I mean, look, we were, uh, 
relieved in a sense to see that we didn't see an explosion of, of more toxicity. Um, I mean, I think this is an important point. So we talked about how very active this drug is, but there is an important toxicity that, that needs to be, I, I, I think people need to be very much aware of physicians and patients. Um, you know, the, it's the lung toxicity. And, and, you know, we identified that back in the early phase one trials, and we've been monitoring patients very carefully on all the ongoing studies. So at the first presentation, we had at that time reported a, an incidence of about 13, 14% of lung toxicity. Thankfully, the majority is of a low grade and, and reversible. Unfortunately, however, there were four cases, fatal cases of lung toxicity, and this was at last year's um, first presentation. Now with this additional follow-up, as you said, we saw three more cases that have been um, uh, confirmed by a, an independent lung uh, review committee. Um, there are three additional cases, two of them were low grade, but unfortunately there was one further grade five uh, lung, toxic, um, lung toxicity related death. So, you know, trying to put it into context though, with nine months more follow-up, we've seen a very tiny increase in the number of, of additional lung events. And so to me, it, it, number one, suggests that the education is getting out there, the message is getting out there, that physicians, patients are aware and they're monitoring for this toxicity. So we're not seeing, uh, you know, a, a continued, you know, large increase in, in that statistic. And I would say that's probably true for all the other ongoing trials with TDXT. There's a lot of oversight. Um, and, and I think for now, that's the key. Um, so, so one of the very, I think, interesting analysis, very exploratory analysis that we were able to present, which may explain why we, we've seen a, just a small increase, is the fact that we, we did a cumulative analysis of, of, of the timing of the incidence of, or of the reporting of these lung toxic events. And you see the majority of patients, if they are going to have lung toxicity, they have it within the first 12 to 14 months. And if you, if you pass that period, it's, it's rare to see late events, although they have been reported, it's, it's the vast majority of cases seems to happen, seem to happen within that first 12 to 14 months. So that may explain why we're not seeing a cumulative. So the longer the patients stay on the study drug, it doesn't mean that they're more likely to get lung toxicity. So to me, that was slightly reassuring um, to, to see that analysis. I think this is a great summary about, about uh, lung toxicity and the Ruxtecan. Let me just add something that we have been discussing together, that the key message from here, in my opinion, and correct me if I am wrong, is that we have to understand that this drug might cause lung toxicity. We have to diagnose it as soon as possible and to treat it without uh, any delay. We do right. not have to wait and see what's happening. Let's start with corticosteroids. And let's start stopping the drug at that time. And the great majority, as you said before, is reversible. And the patient, even if it, if it is grade one, we can reconsider to continue with the drug afterwards. Yeah. So, okay, so, so, so we have to talk about other drug, which also <laughs> had great, great interest and very good results in according to phase three data in this case, which is tucatinib. Tucatinib right. has been approved in the US in the second line setting. To be honest, I was very surprised because according to the clinical trial, the, 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 the patient inclusion criteria was third line or beyond, but the FDA agreed to approve it in the second line. I was a little bit surprised. Maybe we can discuss about that afterwards. But can you give us some, not some thoughts about the clinical trial data, it is already there, but from your perspective, from your clinical practice, we have TDM1 today in the second line setting. However, to cut in is approved in the second line setting. Right. So can you make some practical comments about your perspective about using tucatinib before TDM1 or after TDM1? Any, any thoughts about that, Sanu? I mean, that's a good question. I think I, people are asking that more and more because it, it, it's true in the, the label that tucatinib, so based on, a, again, as you said, a fantastic randomized study, the HER2 climb, we saw impressive results for this, this HER2 selective TKI in combination with capecitabine chemo and trastuzumab. So, you know, just to get back to your, your earlier point, why was it given a second line label? Because again, it was really studied in, in patients who had at least three lines of prior therapy. 
you know, when you, you, you look at the eligibility, they didn't in, allow enrollment of patients who had pertuzumab, uh, trastuzumab, and TDM1 in any line, in any setting. It could have been in the early stage setting, which some patients did get. So in fact, by the time they enrolled on the study, they had had only one line of treatment in the metastatic setting, yet had had all three drugs. And I think the FDA really picked up on that. And so it gave to catnip, I think, this very generous label uh, to be used after one line in, in the metastatic setting. We're I think that's arguing, a good one. Yeah, and we're not arguing with that. We're happy to have as many great options as possible. Sure. So, so now the decision point is between TDM1 and tucatinib. And I have to tell you, the, the one thing that I think impressed all of us probably from the HER2-CLIMB data was the, the data they had in the brain METS population. So not only did they include stable and treated brain patients with stable treated disease, but also with untreated active disease. And we just never see that population enrolled in systemic therapy trials. And not only that, they had the same benefit, the magnitude of benefit even, that the main study population did. And so this is, this is tremendous. This is fantastic news for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. And we know that half of them will get brain metastasis. And that's a big problem in, in our population. So, so, so this was very welcome news. And so now when I think about the decision point between TDM1 and, and the tucatinib um, option, I, I look at the patient I'm, I'm seeing. And, and if their primary uh, area of concern is the CNS, then I'm reaching for tucatinib. Uh, if, if, if everything else is the same and the brain is not the, the most important area to be, you know, addressed, then I think you have two great choices. You know, you have two excellent options. And it becomes, I think, a discussion between the physician and the patient based on the side effects and, and, and the maybe sometimes the convenience of the therapy. And I will add one thing. I mean, the HER2 CLIMB study shows us that tucatinib is extremely active, has a survival advantage after patients get TDM1. So we know it's extremely effective. We don't technically know the reverse sequence to be true uh, based on any clinical studies. So for the time being, I think if it's really a decision point that equal between the two, I am still, for many patients, still using TDM1 often before tucatinib, knowing that tucatinib will work post TDM1. Yeah, no, I think that they are excellent comments. So, okay, so now we have tucatinib there, we have deruxtecan there. I know that we have only phase two data from deruxtecan. We have randomized data from tucatinib. I, I, I might uh, discuss the role of one against the other one for patients with progressing brain metastasis. I think with tucatinib, we have strong data. With deruxtecan, we are running trials on, on that setting. But if known brain meds or stable brain meds, so I know, again, one of them is randomized, the other one is a, a phase two, but the terrific data from your study and also from the phase one study, also published in the Lancet Oncology from the, the, the Japanese colleagues, so that, you know, this median PFS in range of 20 months. Listen, I don't know if, if, if we need randomized trials to say that this is absolutely terrific. So the looks they can, or tucatinib. I think that both are great, great drugs to be used, and you are quite comfortable with both of them, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you and I have drank the Kool Aid here. We both <laughs> have participated in these trials. So, I mean, look, they're they're both. I'm so pleased that we have two active drugs like this for our patients. Really, I, I actually. I get asked the question a lot, which one do you use first and second? And I really hate that question because, you know, the reality is the majority of our patients are going to use both probably if, you know, in sequence. Um, yeah. And right now we're basing sequence of therapy, not on any biological understanding of mechanisms of resistance. It's, it's really, it's really based very clinically. So, so um for that reason, I, I, I think you have two really excellent choices. I will say there is some convenience to an IV therapy once every three weeks in, in trastuzumab deruxtecan uh, versus, you know, it's a triplet therapy with tucatinib. Um, so, so, you know, th there, there are trade-offs. I do also think, and, and there was a hint of CNS benefits 
with trastuzumab direct secanamide, not a, not direct proof in, in this phase two trial, but there's certainly a hint in that data. And there are studies ongoing now looking to see more directly and definitively the benefits of TDXD in, in patients with brain metastasis. So, so yes, very much excited about the phase three data. Right now, I think you have two excellent choices. You discuss them with your patients. Um, and, and, and I think I, there's no wrong answer there. So, Shannon, we have talked about teruxtican, we have talked about tucatinib, but I would like us to discuss a little bit about two other drugs, okay? One of them, for me, I'm sorry about the word, you, you might disagree, and, and I'm happy with that. One of them is the, the ugly duck, okay? So, <laughs> negatinib. So, I don't know if this is the ugly duck because of the data we have, if it is the ugly duck because of the drug, or because of the clinical trial designs. But to be honest, with the data we have with tucatinib and the data we have with neratinib, I think there is absolutely nothing to be compared. Let me guess. Any, any, Let any comments guess. about about neratinib? Any, any thoughts or, or uh, listen? You have neratinib. neratinib approved as well. I mean, look, so, neratinib is we 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 sell it short. I mean, I think it is actually an extremely active therapy. I mean, it's it's definitely finding a niche in the early stage setting. In the late stage setting, I mean, the 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 unfortunate problem for neratinib is that it is a late line drug. So it's approved third line and beyond. By the time most of our patients are going to be candidates for neratinib, they will have already received tucatinib. And so now we're in a situation where we don't know how effective, what more neratinib is gonna offer to these patients. So that's probably the biggest hurdle for neratinib right now. The other thing of course is the toxicity and, and I mean, the advantage of tucatinib is it's very HER2 selective, so it's, it doesn't target HER1 as much, and so there's less GI toxicity. Not to say there isn't. I mean, you do see diarrhea with tucatinib, but we saw much higher grades and higher rates of diarrhea with neratinib. Now, they've done a lot. I think the, there's been a huge investment made into trying to mitigate and minimize the diarrhea risk with neratinib. And I think the control trial shows us that perhaps the best strategy is a, is a gradual dose escalation. And I've actually used that in some patients. I've had the opportunity to do that. You start half dose and you build up slowly and it, it works. I mean, I think patients are much more able to tolerate almost full dose of neratinib using that approach. So, so I do think there is a way to be able to deliver the neratinib uh, unfortunately, it's it's just in a setting now where patients will have had another TKI. I, I think, having said that, there is probably a case to be made, uh, or I think it's reasonable maybe, that we would still try neratinib, particularly for patients where progression in the brain remains their big problem. Post-tucatinib, post-TDXD, post-radiation, we need still things for these patients. And that I think would be a reasonable scenario where you would attempt uh, a trial of neuratinib, which also has great CNS penetration. So I think that, I agree. I think that the Ruxtic and, and, and Tucatinib hopefully will be approved early on time in Europe. And I, I can't agree more with you. To be very, very honest, I, I don't think that with the data we have with Tucatinib today, Neratinib is going to be used a lot, at least this is my opinion. I, I think that you know the benefit of this drug is not terrific. And after tucatinib, we do not have any data to know the advantage of using tucatinib compared with lapatinib, for example. So I, I don't I don't see that neratinib is going to have a, a, a great future, in my opinion, after tucatinib. But I of course I can be I can be wrong. So we only have four or five more minutes, Sanu, but I would like to make some comments about other good drug which is margetuximab, in my opinion, you know, margetuximab was, um, uh, was studied in a phase three study, SOFIA trial against trastuzumab in a face-to-face -face way in combination with chemotherapy. The trial was positive for the primary endpoint, progression-free survival, although it is true, it was, not a, it was not a terrific improvement, but you know, when you compare also the toxicity uh, of trastuzumab and mar margetuximab, it was basically identical a little bit more of infusion related adverse events, but that, that was it. And also the quality of life was maintained with these two drugs. So in case margetuximab is approved, and of course in case margetuximab, the budget, the cost is not very high compared with trastuzumab. What or how you 
foresee the future of this drug in the clinic? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm excited about the margituximab data. I mean, I, I think you're right. It was, uh, the study was positive. It was another phase three study in, in a pretreated cohort of patients. Um, and they saw a PFS, the, the, the PFS uh, improvement of 25% or something. The absolute gain was modest. Uh, and, the, and the survival data are yet immature, actually. So we're still waiting for more updated mature OS data. Perhaps, so, so it's another active drug. It, it, the, the advantage of margituximab is, is it, that it, can, has a, it has the potential to enhance an immune response, I think, against tumors. Um, and so, and so it's, a, it's a wonderful concept. Um, I think we're hoping that maybe the, a prolonged overall survival would support that, um, but we'll wait and wait and see. Um, the, the advantage of, of margituximab is that it's also very uh, safe, as you said. The safety profile is fantastic. Um, so I can see a, a, a role for margituximab, frankly, in, in, a, in a pretreated population where we would normally give chemo X with uh, Hercept trastuzumab, uh, where we may now replace that with margituximab. And, and look, there, there are studies already underway looking to evaluate margituximab in, in the place of trastuzumab in early stage breast cancer, uh, where you know we know that the benefits of immune therapies are even more pronounced in less pretreated patients. So, so maybe we will, we will see a, a better opportunity to use margituximab in earlier, in earlier stage patients. Um, the other exciting thing, of course, as you know, was the, the genomic biomarker, you know, selecting out those patients who are more likely to benefit from margituximab based on, on, on the receptor uh, allele profile. And, and that was, you know, it did show more pronounced benefits from margituximab. So we may have in the future to, to select the best patients for margituximab, which I think is a great way to, to use a drug uh, uh, optimally. So I love the way you say margetuximab. It's not margetuximab. Margetuximab. <laughs> I love it. So Sanu, so in my opinion, you have summarized everything perfectly. I, I think that maybe you will include any other comments, but I think that we have today pertuzumab and TDN1 as the maybe standard of care or the preferred options in the first second line, depending on the treatments received in the early breast cancer setting. But I think that we have terrific agents which are there now and hopefully will be in many other countries early, uh, such as the Ruxtican and, and Tucatinib-based approach with trastuzumab and chemotherapy. Also, margetuximab might play a role in the future of breast cancer as well. We have discussed also the role of neratinib. In my opinion, is quite low, maybe because of Tucatinib. I don't know. But other trials are upcoming, and maybe we will see more and more agents in the future, maybe immunotherapy, maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, um, um, uh, immunotherapy or, 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 or and new antibodies that are conjugates, and, and we said before, maybe um, uh, CDK4 and C inhibitors. We have yeah, other drugs which are... Exciting combinations, actually, you know, not focusing on combining new drugs with our HER2-targeted therapies as well as, I think, as you said, another really exciting, you know, uh, potential for the future. Sanu, you have changed the future of HER2 positive breast cancer thanks to your phase two study. And this is something we all should recognize. So thank you so much on my behalf, but also on behalf of millions of patients that will benefit of these of this drugs. Thank you so much, Sanu. Thank you also so much for your great discussion, for your friendship. You are always there. You are always helping physicians, helping patients. And it is a terrific pleasure to be your friend and to be your colleague. Shanu, oh, Dr. Modi, thanks a million for that. Oh, thank you. I feel the same way, Javier. You know that. So it, thank you for having me. It was really great. I always love talk, talking to you, talking to you about science and medicine. So um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And, and yes, I, I think we're, we both uh, can say we, we remain optimistic about the future when we see great, great data like this. And it's wonderful to talk about it. Thank you. Finally, I would like to thank you all for being here today for logging in and participating in this activity. Medscape, as always, it was a terrific pleasure to, again, to continue uh, working with, with uh, continuing medical, uh, medical education. I think that this is important. And please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. Thank you. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.